Now, an old friend of mine, a frequent guest of mine, and an authority uh, of global significance on the Israel-Palestine issue is Miko Pellet. His father uh, was a general in the Israeli army. Miko Pellet himself served in the Israeli army. But now, and for a long time, he's been in the army of justice, shedding light on the criminal nature of the apartheid state of Israel. And I'm glad, and you should be too, that he's back on the mother of all talk shows this evening. Miko, uh, first of all, I have the melancholy duty of inquiring as to the health of the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. Are you able to enlighten us in any way? First of all, first things first, I haven't congratulated you yet on your victory in the election. So not not for personally anyway, not not like this. So uh, you've given, first of all, so congratulations. You've given hope to a lot of people in, in communities of conscience that have given up on, on the uh, political, on their own political systems here and, and everywhere. So it's yeah. it's wonderful to see you uh, back in parliament. As to Netanyahu, uh, I, I don't really, I don't know anything more than anybody else know. I think that uh, if we're talking about his mental health, I think that's uh, that's something for experts to um, to examine um, because clearly he's a, he's a genocidal maniac. <clears throat> but other than that, I really don't know. I can't. There's nothing more that I can, that, that I know. Well, let's uh, let's speculate. Uh, Sometimes people don't wake up from anesthesia. Sometimes operations go wrong. Uh, sometimes the patient fades away uh, at a man of his age after uh, surgery, which must have uh, been a very rapid one because we haven't heard anything about the eminence of it until uh, he was already under the, the anesthetic. Uh, let's speculate. I pointed out at the beginning of the show that if he were not to wake up or not to be able to continue as Prime Minister, it would, really wouldn't make very much difference because all of the gang around him are at least as bad as he is. Am I right in that? Yes, I mean he basically created a political structure that has no that that has done away with an opposition. There's no opposition, so um, you know when uh, the, the the senator Chuck Schumer, Schumer, the senator from New York, spoke in the in the Senate uh, when was it last week or something, the calling for Israeli elections. You thought what would be the point of that? Number one, I mean they're all the same. They're all in the same boat. They've always all agreed on the issue of Palestine. There's never been any dissent, one way or the other. Um, and there's nobody else to vote for because everybody has been either a, a prime minister or a minister of defense or a minister of something else in Netanyahu's government over over time. So there's really no other option to vote for. So might as well go with Netanyahu because at the end of the day, he's even when he loses the election, he is the only one that's capable of putting together a coalition which is really the magic. The magic is not winning or getting the most votes in Israeli politics. It's knowing how to, you know, thread a coalition together. And there's nobody who does it better than him. And I say this again, you probably remember, I mean, there were times where he actually, his party did not have the most votes. And yet, because they were not able to put together a coalition, he ended up being the prime minister because he was able to make the deals. He's the best horse trader. He's the best politician in, Israeli, in the Israeli political sphere. And, um, he, you know, the, like I said, if it was somebody else, and like you said, it would really make no difference whatsoever on the outcome, certainly not when it comes to the Palestinians. I'm uh, a believer that just as a surgeon cannot operate on his own foot, uh, neither can we expect any significant change from inside Israel itself for the reasons you have adumbrated but also because of the the disappearance of huge parts of the uh, of the Israeli political uh, movements Yesh Gavul and uh, movements for justice of all kinds which were once in their tens of thousands 
in Israel. I used to hang out with them in Shankin Street in Tel Aviv, uh, just off the beach. I have fond memories of it. But they now live in Lisbon. They now live in Paris. They live in the United States. Uh, or they have uh, somehow lost the will to fight. Now, the vast majority of Israelis believe in the annihilation of the Palestinian people in Gaza. That's the sorry truth, isn't it? Yes, uh, I think um, here yeah, one, one more reason that Netanyahu is still relevant is because he's doing exactly what his voters want him to do. They want him to hit. And I remember, you know, I remember people saying this years and years ago, uh, years ago, long before there was a siege, long before. I mean, there's always been a siege, in, in fact, but long before the official siege on Gaza. Um, we need to get in there and just wipe them all out. We need just what, and this was not coming from extremists. This was not coming from fanatics. This was just people talking, just people talking. We need to get in there and flatten the place and just kill all of them. And I would wonder who are these, you know, where, where does this, where does this come from? And so you're right. This is, this is now, uh, this is the, this is the, the, the legitimate discourse on every level, in the press, on the television, in the street. When you look at the social media, you know, some of the just the, just a casual, you know, popular social media platforms, people posting their own stuff, not necessarily the propaganda, but just the, you know, the, just the common things that people post. The discourse is just so horrific and racist. And, um, you, you know, I think I've said this to you before. I've never compared what Israel has done to the Nazis or to the Holocaust, but now it's just... It's just so obvious the discourse, the racism, the the, the what they're doing in Gaza. I mean, this mass mass killing of civilians. They become Nazis, or maybe they're always Nazis, and now this has come. This has brought, brought it out into the open. But this is, I think, how we need to start talking about it, so that the world understands. Uh, you know, in the break earlier, there was a thing about you talking about the need to boycott and how it works. People need to understand why boycotting Israel is so important, why sanctions against Israel are, is so important, because they're like Nazis now. They're behaving and speaking like Nazis. It's time they need to pay a price. They need to be stopped. It is literally a genocidal project, isn't it? If the definition of genocide is to extirpate, either through annihilation or transfer or mass deportation, uh, out of their own land, from their own property, out of the country altogether. I mean, no one could dispute that that is Israel's policy and what Israel is right now doing in Gaza. That's true. And people think that genocide is, you know, running people up and putting them in ovens or, or, or you know, gassing people. Genocide, the, the, actually the definition of the crime of genocide has many aspects to it. And when you take it, and I've done this out of just because I was curious, when you look at the definition of the crime of genocide and you juxtapose it with what has been happening in Palestine the last 76, 80 years, uh, to, you know, 75, 76 years, um, it's almost like somebody in the in the Zionist organizations took a, took a, took a piece of paper and we just wanted to put a check mark next to each and every item that defines genocide. Because it's not just about the people. It's not just about the killing. It's about the, the mass deportation. It's about the destruction of the country. It's about the destruction of a culture and the destruction of a history or the erasure of the history and so on. So there are several aspects to what genocide actually means. And they have checked each and every box as though by intentionally. And so we've got the intent, obviously, which, which is made obvious by their actions. Uh, we have the intent which we hear all the time in their in their speech and what people are saying. And not not only today, going back 75 years. I mean, the intent to destroy Palestinians, get rid of Palestinians is nothing new. It's just that it has, it has a slightly different character today. And so we have a genocidal regime that the world allowed to, you know, commence its genocide so just three years after the end of the genocide of the Jews in Europe, just after the end of the Holocaust. They allowed this genocide to, to, to begin in Palestine. And um, and you wonder, well, at what point are people going to wake up and say, well, genocide is genocide, and it's time to stop it, and it's time to treat it like genocide. 
So I always argue with people who are calling for ceasefire because ceasefire is not the appropriate and is not the appropriate response to genocide. And Israel has signed how many, you know, ceasefire agreements since the initial, the initial uh, ceasefire of 1949 of January, February 1949, which basically established the borders of the state of Israel and and eliminated the Palestinians from any process because these agreements were signed with the countries that border Palestine, but there but nothing with Palestinians. And ever since then, and of course those are violated very, very quickly. And ever since then, Israel has violated every every agreement. So this is this is the reality, and this is something that Israelis have always voted for. Israeli society have always agreed with this, with with some with very few exceptions. So we just as we know why the scorpion stings, because it's a scorpion, we know why colonists believe uh, and behave rather towards uh, those they have colonized because they are colonists. Uh, the bigger question for me, I asked this of Lara Alborno earlier, uh, and she couldn't really answer, and I can't answer, maybe you can. If, the, if a man from Mars arrived uh, and looked at the situation, he would not be puzzled by why the Israeli settler state is doing what it's doing. But he might be questioning of why all these other Western governments are prepared to disrupt their own interests, their own friendships and alliances and even prosperity for the sake of that little uh, colonizing power. They didn't do it to maintain uh, French colonial power in Algeria. Uh, they didn't even do it to maintain uh, French or subsequently American colonial power in Vietnam. Why are they ready, it seems, to break themselves on the wheel of Israeli exceptionalism, Israeli supremacism? Genuinely puzzles me that, Miko. It's a very, very important question. And it... Um... The Zionists have learned from all these other experiences that you've mentioned and others. <laughs> and for the past hundred years, they have invested heavily in creating relationships and developing an influence with education systems, not only in America, but certainly in Britain and in other countries in Europe, where investing and developing relationships with the press in, in you know, all the different cultural spheres in every country in the West certainly with politicians and a political process, so that when people are raised in, you know, Western democracies or, you know, generally in the West, although not exclusively, because this is true in Latin America and to a large degree it's true in Africa as well, people are raised to be Zionists even if they don't realize it. The Zionist education is prevalent and exists across the board everywhere. The reason everybody is a Zionist is because that is what they see. It's what they see in, 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 in all aspects of culture. It's what they learn in all levels of, of their education system. It's what is in movies and in, 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 in literature. It's what's in the press, mostly. So people are genuinely, uh, I think, Zionists, even if they don't understand, if they don't realize it. Now, on top of that, there has never been anything even remotely similar to 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 uh, present the Palestinian story, the Palestinian case, it's not doesn't exist here in America. I know for a fact, half the people you talk to, if you say Palestine, they confuse it with Pakistan, and then beyond that, the people who do know that there's a Palestine know absolutely nothing about it. So when somebody becomes a a decides to become a politician and runs for office, this is the baggage they bring. So for them to support Israel is completely natural. It actually makes perfect sense for politicians in the West to be pro-Israeli because that's all they know. That's all they've ever learned. And it's true for the public too. So suddenly we come up and we say, you have to boycott Israel. And they say, you want to boycott the only Jewish state, the only democracy in the Middle East? You must be anti-Semitic. There's no context. They don't know what you and I know. They have not been educated in this way. So why would they possibly not support Israel? I think actually the support for Israel in the West, and again, like I said, Latin America is very, very strong, and, and in Africa it's very, very strong now, is uh, is perfectly normal. It's perfectly natural. The pro What we need to do 
is we need to double our efforts because we have the truth, we have history, and we have international law on our side. And we need to double our efforts so that what we're seeing in the street, what we're seeing, the popular support for Palestine, which always existed, we need to find the way to elevate it so that it enters the halls of power, so that it enters the, the boardrooms of the press and, and the boardrooms of the you know people who create culture and, and popular culture and so forth. We have not made that transition. And until we do, we're not going to see different results because the education is basically a Zionist education, a pro-Israel education, and it's it's very, very deep. It's very it's fundamental. I was reading uh, something today uh, about the demise of, uh, they went down fighting, but they did suffer uh, the demise of the Comanche people, uh, of original Americans, uh, finally uh, wiped out by the New Mexican militias and the 7th Cavalry and all the rest of the paraphernalia of the American settler state. And my son asked me, Daddy, what's a Comanche? Uh, in other words, uh, the Comanche are in the museum. Uh, they are something that old men like me uh, read about. Arafat always said, maybe he even said it to you, he said it to me a thousand times, uh, we are not the Red Indians, he would say. We're not going to go into the museum of X nations like the Comanche. Uh, sometimes uh, one loses hope uh, that this can all be reversed, uh, but it is hope is returned by the absolute determination of the Palestinian people themselves not to go into that museum. Do you feel that? Oh, without a doubt. I and mean, people ask me all the time, what keeps you going? What inspires you? And I'm like, what do you mean what inspires me? Look at the Palestinian people. Look at the people in Gaza. Uh, how can you not be inspired? And I think you, this is also in the break. I mean, you, your voice was saying we don't have the luxury to lose our to to, to let our spirit to let them, you know, let our spirit down. How could we possibly lose hope when we see the Palestinian people and their accomplishments and their spirit and their and their not just their desire to life but the dignity that they maintain under such horrific horrific conditions? They're subjected now to such horrors that are even unprecedented in in the Palestinian experience. And yet, you look at the children. You look at the. You talk to the people. You speak to elderly women. You see the strength. You hear a woman, you know, talk about her six children being killed, and yet, with all the sadness, there's this dignity that's been maintained. And you know, my, our only wish, of course, is that more people would see this so that they understand what we're talking about. We're talking about a, a nation of, of 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 people who are, who are who are unique in their ability to maintain their dignity and the, and 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 to keep their spirit alive. And that's, of course, that's that's what inspires, I think, all of us that, that keep going, that connection with those people. And it also maintains our, not just our hope that it's possible, but our desire to do everything we possibly can to see the suffering end, to see this apartheid dismantled, to see a free democratic Palestine where these people can live and go back to their lands and, 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 and worship where they want to worship and live the way they want to live and raise these beautiful, beautiful, sweet children. So that is, of course, without a doubt, the biggest source of hope and inspiration and, and also the drive to get this done and to end this suffering once and for all with a political solution that is that, that is that is you know permanent. Uh, Palestine is the moral center of the world, isn't it? Um, Bush famously said, you're either with us or against us. Uh, that same dichotomy exists on Palestine. You are either in favor of those committing genocide or you're on the side of those suffering it. It's quite a simple. They try to make it out as if it's complicated, Miko, but it's actually a common or garden case of white European colonization, extirpation of the native, like they did in Tasmania, successfully, they have not been able to do to the Palestinians. And that's their problem, isn't it? 
Yes, sir. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I have a, I have a, I have a good friend, a Jewish or elderly gentleman activist who lives here in the United States, and he says, "Well, I uh, I reject uh, racism. What's your what's you know what's your perspective? You know, where do you stand? Yeah, there's no there's no there's no other place to stand. You either support genocide or you oppose genocide. It's very very simple. And when you realize, once people do realize that the genocide began with the inception of the state of Israel, with the creation of the state of Israel." then it makes it even more simple, because if you understand what the source of the problem is, what the source of the violence is, you need to dismantle that and to allow something better to take its place. And that's really what we're talking about. One process to dismantle the apartheid regime, which is responsible for the violence and 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 and, and, and is perpetuating the, the, the genocide, and on the other, to start building this hopeful vision creating seeing this vision materialize of a free democratic palestine with equal rights and putting in mechanisms putting in place real mechanisms to allow the refugees to return so this is very very simple actually you don't have to invent the wheel it's been done before and then this will without any question allow the people who live in historic palestine whether they're jews or muslims or christians and so on, or whoever, to, to live in peace, to live a normal life, uh, finally. This is the remedy. This is the magic, the, the magic, you know, the, the magic pill, pill, if you will. Well, it is Easter. We can hope for resurrection indeed. Thank you, Miko Pellet, for, as always, a dazzling tour de horizon.